welcome. So uh, to everyone that has uh, joined us on Zoom today, thank you so very much and welcome to the Greensburg Chautauqua. This is my 26th Chautauqua event, which is brought to our small little neck of the world, literally hundreds of culturally or historically or scientifically significant individuals from Holocaust survivors to a Nobel Peace Laureate, really icons from all over the planet, but none are as iconic as today's guest speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to present to you, Dr. Jane Goodall. Well, <clears throat> thank you, John. And I don't quite agree with what you just said, but then we'll let that pass. And so I know for, for you, it's the middle of the day. For me, it's towards evening. So I think the best thing I can do is to greet you as you might be greeted if you came with me to Gombe National Park in Tanzania and hear the chimpanzees. <laughs> That's the chimpanzee distance call, and it simply means this is me, Jane. So this is me, Jane. And it's a great pleasure to be talking to so many uh, students and faculty today. And I want to start for a minute at the beginning to, I mean, John, you just said I was iconic. Well, when I was a little girl, the last thing I wanted to be was any kind of public figure. I was terribly shy. I never spoke at school. You know, if I was asked to speak, I made some excuse. So anyway, it all began because I was born loving animals. I was born uh, and grew up in the UK. I was born in London and grew up in Bournemouth, where I am now. I'm speaking to you from the house where I, where I grew up and behind me, are books that I read as a child and just outside the window is the tree I named him Beach and I used to spend hours up in the branches I felt closer to the birds and every moment I could I was outside and I was watching birds and squirrels and insects and plants and you name it people say what triggered your love of animals I don't know I was born with it I think Maybe something happened when I was in my mother's womb, I don't know. But anyway, I was born loving animals and I was born to an amazing and supportive mother. And that made all the difference. So when I was one and a half, apparently, I don't remember, but uh, she told me she came into my room to say good night and found I'd taken all these wriggly earthworms to bed with me. And so most mothers would have got angry because of course there was a lot of earth too but she just said Jane we need to take them outside or they might die and then a story which you may have heard but I tell it for a reason because I think you have the making of a little scientist in this story I was four and a half years old and mum took me to stay on a farm in the country and as we lived in London at that time, um, it was very, very exciting to go to a farm where there were a, a proper farm, not a factory farm, cows, pigs, horses out in the fields. And I was given the job of collecting the hen's eggs or some of them anyway. And there were about, I know, six, eight little hen houses where they slept at night. And that's where they usually went to lay their eggs. So I was collecting the eggs in my little basket. And apparently, I don't remember, but I kept saying, well, where does the egg come out of the hen? I couldn't see a hole that big. And nobody told me. So I distinctly remember seeing a hen, she was brown and she was going into one of these hen houses. And I must have thought, ah, she's going to lay an egg. So I crawled after her, big mistake. I can still feel her wing brushing my cheek and her squawks of fear. And again, in that little four and a half year old mind, I must have thought, no hen will lay an egg here. This is a dangerous place. So I went into an empty hen house and waited. And apparently I waited for at least four hours. The family didn't know where I was. Um, my mother had even called the police. And yet when she saw this little girl rushing towards the house, Instead of getting angry, how dare you go off without telling us? She sat down, 
to hear the wonderful story of how a hen laid an egg. And I still can see that hen coming in. This one was, I think it was brown as well. And seeing her rise up slightly on her legs and this spherical, slightly soft object plopping down onto the straw. So I don't know who was more excited, me or a hen. Anyhow, I tell that story because, as I say, it's the making of a little scientist, curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer, deciding to find out for yourself, making a mistake, not giving up, and learning patience. It was all there. And a different mother might have crushed that early curiosity. And I might not have done what I've done. So when I was growing up, which some young people today find very hard to believe, but when I was growing up all those years ago, there was no television, no social media, no none of the stuff which young people can't live without today, at least in the US and Europe. And so it was books. I depended on books. I loved books. And my mother helped me find books about animals. Mostly they came from the library. We couldn't afford new books. We didn't have much money. And it was during the war. And so when I was eight years old, I met Dr. Doolittle. And if you haven't met Dr. Doolittle, you should. And then when I was 10, I found this little book in a secondhand bookshop and I'd saved up just enough money to buy it. And that was Tarzan of the Apes. So of course, I fell passionately in love with that glorious Lord of the Jungle. And I was really jealous when he married the wrong Jane. Well, I knew the, the Tarzan, but that's when my dream began. I will grow up, I will go to Africa, I will live with wild animals and I'll write books about them. <laughs> Everybody laughed. How will you do that? You don't have money. Africa's far away and you're just a mere girl. Girls don't do things like that, but not my mother. She said, and I think the rest of the family too, if you really want this thing, you're going to have to work awfully hard. And if you take advantage of every opportunity, and if you don't give up, maybe you'll find a way. So that's the message that I've taken as I travel. I used to travel around the world 300 days a year. And so many people have come up to me and said, Jane, I want to thank you because you taught me that because you did it, I can do it too. So anyway, to go back to me, this little girl, I did well at school, but I, I didn't like school. I wanted to be out studying animals. And when I left school, most of my friends went to college, but we couldn't afford it. So there was just enough money for a very boring old secretarial course. And I got a job in London. It was an interesting job. You can't save money in London. You certainly couldn't then. And the opportunity that I'd been waiting for that I somehow knew would happen was when a school friend invited me for a holiday in Kenya where her parents had just bought a farm. Had to work in a hotel around the corner as a waitress. It took about five months. It was very hard work. And finally enough money to get a return fare to Kenya. You had to be able to prove that you could come back. They didn't want to be stranded with all kinds of people who arrived and then had no money to return. The first journey I took was by boat because planes weren't flying back and forth at that time. And it was a long journey. If you look at your map, the quickest way from London to Mombasa in Kenya is through the Suez Canal and going south down the, um, the west coast of, of Africa. But there was a silly war between England and Egypt and the Suez Canal was closed. So our boat had to go all the way down and around Cape Town and up to Mombasa. So the first place where I set foot on African soil was Cape Town. Some of you may have been there. It's very beautiful. It was that iconic table mountain. And mom had some friends there who said, well, we'll look after Jane for the two days the ship 
stop to, I suppose, to get new supplies. And it was beautiful and I was excited. But then I saw on the backs of all the seats and doors to the restaurants and everything, these words in Afrikaans, slechts blanc. What do these words mean? White people only. I wasn't brought up that way. My grandfather was a congregational minister. We didn't judge people on the color of their skin. We judged them as human beings. So from that moment, I wanted to leave. And when I got to Kenya, it was better because it was just on the brink of independence. And it was a very different atmosphere. At any rate, I stayed with my friend. And then I heard about the late Dr. Lewis Leakey. And somebody said I should meet him if I was interested in animals. So I went to the Natural History Museum and he asked me all kinds of questions about the animals and I'd read everything I could. Now listen to this. Two days before I arrived, his secretary had suddenly quit. He needed a secretary. That boring old secretarial course, you never know when something's going to come in useful. So now I'm surrounded by people who can answer my questions about the animals and the plants of, of Africa. And it was during those days that I think Leakey realized that I really was passionate about animals, that I was the kind of person who could, you know, didn't want much in the way of material comfort. And so he asked me if I would like to go and study wild chimpanzees. Nobody had studied them. And of course, yes, yes, yes. Took him a year to get the money. British authorities refused to allow me, because it was still under British colonial rule, uh, to go to Gombe National Park where the chimps are by myself. So who volunteered to come? That same amazing mother. And it, she stayed four months. I had money for six months. And she was a wonderful help because in those early days, the chimpanzees were very conservative, never seen a white ape before. And we are the fifth great ape. And they would take one look and vanish into the vegetation. And I was getting more and more depressed because, you know, I knew with the time I could win their trust, just as I had with the animals around my home. But did I have the time? It was running out. And it was Mama who was saying, Jane, you found this peak. And from there, you're learning much more than you think about the chimpanzee calls that they make, how they wander around, sometimes alone, sometimes mothers and infants, sometimes little groups, sometimes the whole of what we now know is a community coming together when a special fruit has ripened, and uh, how they make nests up in the trees at night, bending over the branches. So she, she served to boost my morale. And it was a bit sad. It was just two weeks after she left that the breakthrough observation came. And the chimpanzee who made that breakthrough observation for me was the one who had first begun to lose his fear. I could get closer to him than to the others. And I named him David Graby, and he's up here behind me. He's a very, very special chimpanzee. And he is, was very distinctive. They all are very different, and you can see that distinctive white beard on his chin. So David Greybeard was sitting on a termite mound, picking off grass stems, using them to fish termites from their underground burrow, picking leafy twigs and stripping the leaves. He was using and making tools. And at that time, scientists believed only humans could use and make tools. And we were known as man the tool maker. That changed everything. Leakey went to the National Geographic. They agreed not only to fund the research when the six months money ran out, but also to send a photographer, filmmaker, Hugo van Lauig, to document what I was finding out about the chimps. And so I could then settle back. I could relax. There was money. I didn't have to worry all the time. And gradually I was learning more about these closest relatives of ours. We didn't realize back then they hadn't done all the DNA analysis to show that we and chimpanzees share 98.6% of our DNA. But kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another, sharing food, 
uh, good mothers and bad mothers, good mothers being supportive, just like my mother was. And looking back now over 60 years of observations, we know that the offspring of the supportive mothers do better. The females are better mothers. We seldom raise more than three offspring. They're not overpopulating their environment like we are. And the males tend to reach a higher position in the male dominance hierarchy and probably sign, well, definitely some of them sign more infants. And when males are competing for dominance, they stand upright, they swagger from foot to foot, they puff out their hair, they scowl ferociously. They remind me so much of some male politicians. At any rate, I was sad to find that like us, they have a dark and aggressive side. They can even have a kind of primitive war but like us, they also show love, compassion, and altruism. So I'd been out there for about two years when Leakey said I had to go to Cambridge. I had to get a degree. There wasn't time to mess about with an undergraduate degree, he said. He got me a place to do a PhD in animal behavior. And to my dismay, the professors, and I was nervous of them. Remember, I'd never been to college even. And they told me I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. They should be numbered. That was scientific. And they couldn't talk about them having personality or mind or emotion. Those were unique to us. But I'd already learned as a child from my dog and the other animals that I grew up with that that wasn't true. So I just calmly went on talking about the chimps' different personalities and their way of solving problems and how they could feel happiness, sadness, fear, despair, grief, and so on. And what with those detailed descriptions and Hugo's film, the scientists gradually began to realize that after all, there wasn't a difference in kind between us and animals. It was a difference of degree only, and that we are part of and not separate from the rest of the animal kingdom. And you know, I often talk about how amazingly intelligent some animals are. We're finding out more and more about animal intelligence. Anyway, I got my degree and I went back to Gombe and I built up a research station. We have just celebrated 60 years of unbroken research on those chimpanzees. And we're studying chimps in six other African countries as well. And Back there in Gombe were the best days of my life. I could spend hours out in the rainforest understanding how everything is interconnected out in nature. And this rich variety of animals and plants that make up an ecosystem, this biodiversity, is so very important. So why did I leave? I left because I went to a conference which I helped to organize. We brought together the people from different chimpanzee sites because there were others by then. And during that conference, which was learning about chimp behavior, we had a session on conservation, which was shocking. Right across Africa, chimpanzee numbers were dropping, forests were disappearing, foreign companies were coming in, logging and mining, and the African populations were growing. And so I felt I needed to actually get out to Africa and learn more about it firsthand, what was the problem. And yes, I learned a lot about the problems facing the chimpanzees, the hunting, the habitat loss, the bushmeat trade, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, and the animal trafficking, which is something that's grown and grown and we have to address today. But back then, I also learned about the plight of so many of the African people living in and around chimpanzee habitat in Africa. And it came to a head when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park. And when, when I began in 1960, it was part of this great forest belt. We called it the Equatorial Forest Belt that stretched from East Africa across to the West Coast, almost unbroken. But by 19... Uh, 90 when I flew over in a small plane 
I was shocked to see a very small island of forest. Gombe is a very small national park, only 35 square kilometers, the smallest in Tanzania. And by 1990, this tiny area of forest was surrounded by completely bare hills, more people living there than the land can support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere. And that's when it hit me. If we don't do something to help these people find ways of making a living without destroying the environment, we can't save chimps, forests, or anything else. So the Jane Goodall Institute, which I had started by then, started a program, Take Care, or we call it Takari. It's very holistic, and there's no time to go into it now, but it's all out there online. But basically, it's a, it's a program that is lifting people out of poverty. It's helping women get started on small businesses with little micro loans. It's getting scholarships to keep girls in school during and beyond puberty so that they have a chance of going into higher education. And we provide family planning information, which the people are so pleased to get because the, the women want to educate their children. They can't afford to educate eight, nine, ten children, which is the average that they used to have. So then we introduced cutting edge technology and the, the uh, volunteers from the 104 villages where now we work, they learn to use smartphones and they record the health of their forest. They're very proud. They record an illegally cut tree or an animal trap, or outside of a chimp nest, or a leopard, or a pangolin, something like that. This all goes up to a platform in the clouds. So because the people now understand, and not only around Gombe, but in all six countries where we're working with chimps, the people understand that protecting the environment isn't just for wildlife, it's for their own future. Because we depend on the, in, the environment. We depend on the natural world. We're part of it and we depend on it for food, for water, for clothing, for everything. And as we continue to destroy it, then we're destroying the future of all you young people. And we've been doing this for a very long time. And isn't it bizarre that the most intellectual creature to ever walk the planet, the biggest difference between us and chimps uh, is destroying its only home. I think because we, we've, we're very intellectual, but we seem to have lost wisdom. We need to come up with solutions, not only with the clever brain, but the human heart, love and compassion. So as I'm traveling around the world by this time, trying to raise awareness and money, I'm meeting many young people, maybe some of you, who told me they'd lost hope. They felt depressed or angry or apathetic. And when I asked them why, well, because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, as I'm sure all of you know, we have compromised your future, there's no question. And it's not true that there's nothing to be done about it. And that's why I started the Roots and Shoots program back in 1991 with 12 Tanzanian high school students who came to talk to me about the problems they saw in the world around them, the street children with no homes, the poaching in the national parks, the illegal dynamite fishing that was destroying the coral reefs, the cruel treatment of dogs, cats, animals in the market. They have so many concerns. So I told them to go and find their friends who felt the same. They came from eight different schools, these 12. And we had a meeting and Roots and Shoots was born. And the main message is every single one of us makes an impact on the planet every single day. And we have a choice as to what sort of impact we make. And we can start thinking about what we buy. Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? And make the right choice. And so we decided from the start that each Roots and Shoots group would choose, they would choose themselves three different projects to make the world better. One to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. 
And at the same time, because we try and bring young people together, usually virtually, but sometimes groups come together and they begin to understand what I mentioned at the beginning, that far more important than the color of the skin, the culture, the religion, is the fact that we're all human beings. We share the same blood, we have the same feelings. So Roots and Shoots from that little beginning is now in 86 countries. We just officially launched India two days ago, a week before we launched Roots and Shoots in Turkey. And very soon there'll be Roots and Shoots in Israel. And it's a family of young people from kindergarten, university, everything in between, growing all the time, young people who understand that, yes, we all need money to live, but it goes wrong when we live for money, unless we live for money to help make the world a better place, which is a very good thing to do. So it, the, there are three major problems that have to be overcome before we can move into the world that we all really wish for. We've got to alleviate poverty so that poor people will no longer be poor and they too can make ethical choices in how they live. We've got to reduce the unsustainable lifestyle of so many of the rest of us. And we've got to at least think about the problems posed by the growing human populations if we carry on with business as usual. It's crazy to think we can have unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources which are already being used up in some places faster than nature can repair them. But people say to me, Jane, do you really have hope when you look around and see the destruction of the habitat, the animal populations that are suffering, the loss of biodiversity, the, in, the, the social and, and political problems that are in the world today, the discrimination, the difference between haves and have-nots growing bigger. It's a pretty grim picture, isn't it? But Roots and Shoots really has the answer because we hear think globally, act locally. No, if you think globally, you get depressed. You can't help it. But if you act locally and you see, I and my friends are making a difference. And then you know that all around the world in all these other countries, young people like you are making a difference. Then you dare think globally. So I've got these four reasons for hope. And most of all, it's young people. Because I think once you know the problems and we empower you to take action, which is what Roots and Shoots and other programs do, and listen to your voices, then there's nothing like you young people when you are inspired to take action. You are changing the world, absolutely, as we speak. There are groups doing amazing things that they think up themselves, not the littlest ones. They need guidance, but they know the sort of thing they want to do. And the second reason for hope is this intellect. Yet, yes, we've made a mess of things, but more and more scientists are coming up with innovative solutions which will help to slow down climate change, which is probably the biggest threat we face. And so we in our individual lives are thinking of ways we can leave lighter ecological footprints. And then the next reason for hope is the resilience of nature. If you fly over Gombe now, you will not see those bare hills anymore. And places we've utterly destroyed when given a chance and maybe some help can once again support life and nature and become vibrant, living, beautiful places instead of wastelands or places covered with cement or places where the soil has been killed by our ridiculous use of poisonous chemicals to grow our food, which is poisoning the soil. And so we, we are coming up with ways of rewilding nature. We're coming up with ways of restoring the natural world. We're coming up with ways of rescuing endangered species which are on the brink of extinction, but they can be given another chance. 
And finally, there's what I call the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems impossible and they won't give up. And very often they succeed. Some of them are icons like Nelson Mandela who worked with, with de Klerk to end the evil regime of apartheid in South Africa. And then Martin Luther King. But there's not just these icons, it's people some people who have tremendous disadvantages, either physically or socially. And they lead lives that are absolutely inspirational to people around them. I meet them everywhere. And you know something? Every single one of us has this indomitable spirit. Some people are afraid to let it grow. They think that they don't make a difference. But as is the mantra of Roots and Shoots, every single one of us makes a difference every single day and we have a choice. How will we use this gift of our life to make the world better or don't we care? So that's the message I have for you. I've spoken one minute too long, John, but uh, perhaps you'll forgive me for that. I will forgive you for that. <laughs> and uh, now I think we, we have some questions which I will do my best to answer. And I'm rounding up the, the troops now. Dr. Jane, could I start with one? You have a number of pictures and books behind you. Would you mind sharing your favorite picture and your favorite book that's behind you? Well, I, I don't have a favorite. I mean, I showed you David Graybeard, favorite chimp. My dog, Rusty, is, is here. I adore elephants and they need so much help. This is very special. Maybe if I had to pick one most important, it would be my mother. Yes. Yeah. Her words are still with me. I still think of her every day. She died in 2000. She was uh, 96, so she had a good long life. I still miss her. And then there's um, the books. Well, I should have the story, the um, story of Dr. Doolittle, and I should have Tarzan of the Apes. But they went off to National Geographic, who started an exhibit in Washington, D.C. called The Coming Jane or something like that. And so those books are there. They're, they're locked down in Washington, D.C. So I haven't seen that exhibit yet. Thank you, Dr. Jane. And I think I have Lydia here for your first question. Hello. Hello. So I know you talked about some of the similarities between humans and chimpanzees, but what is the lesson? Talk, talk a bit slower because you're looking down, so I can't hear you very well. So talk a bit louder. Um, I know you talked about some of the similarities between humans and chimpanzees, but what is the lesson we as humans could learn from the nature of chimpanzees? What? Say that again. The last. Yes. Bit. What? The last bit. Just the last bit. Yeah. What is the lesson we as humans could learn from the nature of chimpanzees? Oh, well, I think the most important thing we learn is, you know, what it is that's different. So we know how we're the same. It, it suggests that, as Louis Leakey thought, about six million years ago, there was an ape-like, human-like ancestor. And Leakey believed if Jane sees behavior that's the same or similar, in humans today and chimpanzees today, maybe that was present in the common ancestor and came with us along our separate evolutionary pathways. But as I said, you know, we are so like chimpanzees in so many ways, but we're different. I mean, chimps are highly intelligent. Like many other animals, chimps can work on computers and learn sign language, but they couldn't design a rocket that goes up to Mars from which a little robot creeps off that takes photographs of the surface of Mars. And if you've seen those photographs, there's a lot of new ones coming up. You don't want to go and live there. It makes you feel even more passionate about saving the beautiful planet that we have. <laughs> I think our next question, Dr. Jane, is from Brenner. And please stand by, John. So if I can't hear, uh, because sometimes it's difficult when they're looking down, just, just shout it out for me. I you? sure will. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm, oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brenner, and my question is, what is your favorite memory with a chimpanzee? I can certainly hear you, thank you. Um, well, I've got two. One is right in the early days when David Graybeard allowed me to follow him. Because at first I would let him wander off alone. I thought I didn't want to push him. And on this occasion, I lost him going through a thicket of tangled, thorny undergrowth. But when I got through, there he was sitting, looking back. I mean, it looked as if he was waiting for me. I don't know, maybe he was. So I sat down near him. And lying on the ground between us was a ripe red palm nut, Jim's loved them. So I picked it up and held it out on my hand, and he turned his face away. So I put my hand closer, and he turned, he looked directly in my eyes. He reached out, took and dropped the nut, then very gently squeezed my fingers, which is how chimpanzees reassure each other. So in that moment, we communicated in a way that must have preceded human words and he knew that my, my my motivation was good he didn't want the nut and i knew that so it was a very special moment and the other one is when the old female flo lost her fear to such an extent that although she was a little nervous she was a little four year old five year old five month five month old infant flint towards me unsteady on his feet looking up at me with those big, big, curious eyes. And he reached out and touched my nose. And those two moments I will never forget. <laughs> okay, I think we are ready for Allie now. Allie, are you ready? Yes. Hi, Dr. Goodall, my name is Allie. And my question for you is, Besides chimps, if there could be any other animal that you could go out into the wild and study, what animal would it be and why? Well, I tell you, I have had the opportunity of watching many animals in Africa and the different national parks. And the animal that absolutely fascinated me, and I would love to continue studying, is the hyena. Now, you may find that's a strange choice. What's fascinating is chimpanzees live in communities, they're territorial, they protect their territories, and the males are dominant. Hyenas live in clans that protect territories, and the females are dominant. So why? Why in chimps is it males and in hyenas is it females? Male chimpanzees fight to protect the territory. If females were fighting, they've got these babies for five years clinging to their chest, they're raising kids. It wouldn't be good for them to fight. And so the males are dominant. In hyena society, the, it's the only carnivore that doesn't take food back to the den. They just take themselves with their milk. So the females that are the most dominant, the biggest and the most aggressive get more of the kill made by the clan. And therefore their milk is richer and therefore their babies grow faster. So it's absolutely fascinating to see and, and hyenas live about the same time as chimps in the wild, about 40 years. And they're so fascinating, such amazing individual characters. Do Dr. Jane, it sounds like we've got a little less volume on your end. We can still hear you, but. Well, I'll come closer to them. I can come closer. Oh, that's wonderful. And our, ne our next question is from Molly. Hi, my name is Molly. Do you think you have impacted the way the world looks at women in research? Well, I'm told so. I meet so many young women who say, uh, I went into this career because I read about you when I was a child and decided I wanted to go into science too. So I think the answer to that has to be yes. I mean, I didn't set out to do that, but it seems to have been a result of people reading about what I've done. And as I said, saying to me, thank you for teaching me because you did it, I can do it too. Our next question is from Zara. Hi, 
Um, I wanted to ask you what the most groundbreaking thing you learned in the jungle was that you didn't initially suspect. Well, I think the most groundbreaking was this horror that chimpanzees like us can actually have war. It's, it's between neighboring communities. It's basically the males and um, finding that if a group of males, when they patrol their territory, if they see an individual, usually a fe an older female, they will hunt, chase, and if they catch that individual, they will subject him or her to a really brutal attack, which can lead to death. And so there was one time, I call it the four-year war. It was the worst time I was at Gombe, when the males of one community systematically picked out, attacked, and left to die the males of the smaller community in the south. And what made it even worse was that that group in the south had originally been part, it was all one community. And then some of the males split off and moved south with some females and took up, took up their territory in the south of what had been the range of everybody. So I think the northern males, there were more of them, they wanted to get that territory back. So it was like a civil war and it was very, very horrible to watch, but an eye opener. Thank you. Amari, Amari, are you there? Can you hear me all right now? Yes. What is your favorite adventure you've ever had? My favorite adventure? Mm -hmm. Well, I think my favorite adventure was the first trip that I took to Gombe from Nairobi. It's, I can't remember how many miles, but it's right across um, Tanzania. Then you go a little bit through Uganda, then you come to Tanzania. And it was in a, a very overloaded Land Rover, and I was with mum, and we passed through amazing country. There were no proper roads, so the car often got stuck. And... I mean, it was, it was just fascinating. You wake up in a forest and there'd be all kinds of strange sounds around you. And in those days, there were so many animals. They're not there now, they've gone. But there were lions and all kinds of exciting creatures. So it took us four days. We set up our little tents each night. And I'll never forget that journey. It was pure magic. Hi, my name is Jessica Williams, and my question for you is, who or what inspired you to become a primatologist and an anthropologist? Well, Louis Leakey, when I went to Africa, I, I, I went there, as, I, as you heard, with no college, no college behind me. I just wanted to be a naturalist. I wanted to have a chance to go and live with wild animals. And I wanted to write books about them because I've always loved writing. It was Louis Leakey who determined that he wanted me to go and study chimpanzees. It was Louis Leakey who said I had to get a, a degree in ethology, the study of behavior. And so it was Louis Leakey who pushed me into a scientific career. But I took into that science my own conviction about who and what animals are. I didn't fall into the way of scientific thinking at that time which was why Lewis told me later he wanted someone who hadn't been to college. He wanted someone whose mind hadn't been filled up with all this ridiculous way that the scientists were thinking back then, that there was this difference in kind between us and other animals. So I think he chose quite well. Is Elizabeth on the call? Is Elizabeth, are you here? Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, hello, Dr. Goodall. My name is Elizabeth Redmond, and you sort of touched on this in your talk, but there are many, there's a lot of overlap between the social sciences and the natural sciences. How has that overlap influenced your research and your written work? Um, particularly uh, with its ties to uh, history and your work with social causes? Well, I don't know that it has. You know, I've always been a bit kind of weird and gone my own way and written things. But now we 
I built up a research station back in 1986. And we have students coming in from all kinds of different disciplines. And we find out that the chimp research has influenced even law, believe it or not. In fact, I wrote a fun little paper about order without law, instead of law, law and order. But anyway, so, you know, the chimpanzee research has impacted on many, many different disciplines. And having students from these different disciplines working together at Gombe, they're not there now, of course, but that really expanded the way that we thought about chimps and that they thought about people. So it was a, it was a nice combination. Our next question is from Rebecca. Hi, my name is Rebecca, and you entered your career at a time where women were just starting to be taken seriously in science. Um, did you have any doubters? And if so, how did you get over that criticism? Uh, well, actually, when I began, there weren't more women really going into science. I was a little bit before that. Although by the time I finished getting my PhD, there were more women appearing in science. Well, as I said, when I got to Gombe, I was told I'd done everything wrong. And I was told that only human beings had personalities and minds and emotions. We now you know, I mean, I think for anyone wanting to study animal behavior, this is the most exciting time. I mean, we now know, I've, I've explained about chimpanzees and how intelligent they are. I think we all know how intelligent elephants are and things. But think what we're finding out, pigs. If you don't know, look at Google, not Picasso the artist, but pig Picasso. Just Google pig Picasso, and you will be amazed at what you see. The pigs are at least as intelligent as dogs and more intelligent than some. Then there are these miracle dogs that can learn hundreds and hundreds of words and what they mean. And we now know that the octopus is incredibly intelligent. So the field of animal intelligence is blooming and it, it's really an exciting time. And you know, there are people studying animal personality, animal emotions, and that's the horror of these factory farms where billions of cows and pigs and, and sheep and chickens and turkeys are, are kept in these horrendous conditions. Every single one of them has a personality. Every single one of them is an individual with his or her own life. They all can feel fear, terror, pain. And we've just got to stop this way of treating animals and understand that they are sentient beings and we should be sharing the world with them we should not be treating them as mere objects they're not they're amazing beings in their own right dr jane if i could get you to get just a little closer to the mic again and i've got lillian coming up Good afternoon, Ms. Biddle. My question for you was how does the how does the pand current pandemic correlate with the human encroachment on wildlife habitats? Sorry, 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 you're speaking so fast. What's the question? How does the current pandemic correlate with human encroachment on wildlife habitats? John, I sorry, I didn't Okay. Dr. Jane, how does the current pandemic correlate with human encroachment on wildlife habitats? Oh, okay. Well, it, uh, this pandemic is our fault. And those studying these zoonotic diseases have been predicting this for a very long time, that there'll be a pandemic. And as, as we invade uh, animal habitats, we crowd them closer to each other, which can lead to new diseases. We crowd some of them to have closer contact with humans. And when this happens, a, a pathogen like a bacteria or a virus can spill over onto a human. When that happens, this may bond with the cell in the human body and create a new disease, in this case, uh, COVID-19, which uh, the, other, the other major situation we create, which is, which is really enabling these, these diseases to start up, is animal trafficking, where you hunt, kill, eat, 
and all, but you also send them around the world for sale in the wildlife markets for food, for medicine, for skins, or for pets. And in these wildlife markets, like the factory farms, animals crowded together in stressful situations, it's a perfect opportunity for a new zoonotic disease. And this one, as you know, is probably started in a wildlife market in China. So we, we just have to find a new way of interacting with animals on the natural world. Thank you. And by the way, we can all help by eating less or no meat or going vegan because to feed all these billions of animals, they have to, they have to be fed and areas of habitat are cleared. Grain must be grown lots of fossil fuel to get the grain to the animals, the animals to the abattoir, the meat to the table. Water, so precious in some places. You use a lot of water to change vegetable to animal protein. And they all produce methane gas in their digestion. And that is a very, very virulent greenhouse gas. I've got Emma coming up next. Hello, Ms. Goodall. Hello. Okay. My question for you is many face obstacles similar to you to fulfill their dreams. How do you keep preserving and keep the determination to never give up? Because I'm an obstinate person by nature, because I'm very passionate about the environment, about animals and about children. And there's no way I could possibly give up. I'm not made that way. So the more obstacles I, uh, I'm confronted by, the more I sort of, you know, just, get my chin out and say, I'm not going to be defeated. I won't. I won't give in. So that's just the nature I have. But it's really because I, I care and I'm passionate. And I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't know that it makes a difference. So that's not being boastful. It's simply that people tell me wherever I go that they come to a talk or they read a book or something like that. And it helps them. It changes them. It it gives them hope for the future and they promise that they'll do their bit and millions of little bits of good change make a different world thank you so much our next one is from cole hello miss goodall my question for you is how do you suggest we deal with the overwhelming task of saving our planet well First of all, I'm glad that there's one of the of the male sex asking a question. It's been all very one-sided so far. Um, well, join Roots and Shoots. I mean, I'm serious about that because then you'll be lots with lots of other young people. You can sit down, you can have discussions. What do you care about? We We can all contribute in our own way. Everybody can contribute something different. Fortunately, we're different. We want to solve different problems. But if, we, if we're together in a group and there are some wanting to help animals, some wanting to help people, some wanting to deal with the environment, and they share what they're doing, then you realize it's all interconnected. And you can't help animals without saving the environment. And you can't, uh, you know, I mean, I've been told so often, you can't do it all when we started this Take Care to Kari program. But they said you've got to choose. You've got to work with education or, or, or farming or something. You can't do it all. And I said, well, what's the point of educating girls if they go back to their village and they die because there aren't good health facilities? It's all interrelated, everything in this life. So we can shoot for you, okay? Thank Anything you. going in your school? John will help. I will. <laughs> Dr. Jane, I've got Connor coming up. Hello, Dr. Goodall. Good show. Um, my question is, what advice would you give your younger self about the research you would complete in the coming years? Well, my younger self, you know, people often say, well, what advice would you give your younger self? By muddling along in the way, the only way I knew, I sort of managed to weave a really good path. And so I don't think I would want to give my younger self any 
any advice because I think my younger self did pretty well without advice from anybody except Dr. Leakey saying he believed in me. And uh, so, you know, but the advice I give to other young people is follow your dream. Just the advice my mother gave to me. If you really want something, work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity and don't give up. And an important thing, you might not get there straight away. You might want to do something and things don't quite work out. Like people come up to me crying and say, I wanted to work with the environment or animals, but my parents or my teachers, they wanted me to do business. This is very often the case in, in Asia. And so I said, well, do what your parents or your teachers want. Do it well. And you can still help the environmental animals every single day that you live. And then when you finally reach a certain point in that career that you didn't really want to do, but you've done your best, you can change. And then you can jump into conservation. Many people do that. Thank you. Next up is Elena. Hi, Dr. Goodall. Hi. My question for you is, did you ever feel like you were missing out on a more normal life out of the forest? <laughs> no way. Ever since I was tiny, I wanted to leave that life and go and live in the forest. And I felt at home right from the beginning. And people say, you know, after my mother left, weren't you lonely? Well, being lonely and being alone are two different things. And I loved being alone. So I wasn't lonely. And I did get a little strange, you know, I was a year on my own. And I found that I was talking to the trees. They all have their own personalities. And I was talking to objects. And But it was magical. I loved those years. They were the best years of my life, just learning about the forest and being part of it and feeling. I felt a great spiritual connection with some great spiritual power when I was out in the forest. Thank you. And our next one is Mackenzie. Hello. My question is, what is the most outrageous encounter that you've ever had with someone who disagreed with your work? The most outrageous encounter. Now there's a question. Because <laughs> when when I was growing up, my mother said to me, when you meet somebody who disagrees with you, then first of all, listen to them because they may have a point that you haven't thought about. But then if you still feel, well, I'm brighter than they are, or at least I believe in what I believe, then have the courage of your conviction to carry it through. But the most outrageous, oh, well, maybe an encounter with a, with um. Uh, I don't know. I can't think of the most outrageous at all. But I'll tell you one thing which may be useful for people to hear. When I first got back from Gombe, I'd been with the chimpanzees for a year and a half. And before I went, I'd worked in the London Zoo. Just I was working with the documentary film unit. And there were two chimpanzees, and they were in horrible condition. Tiny bear cage, no running water. It was beastly. And so when I went back to visit my friends at the zoo, they said, ah, Jane, you've got a big press conference here tomorrow. You can talk about the chimps and help them. And I was all excited. But just by chance or chance, I don't know, that evening I was having dinner with the last uh, Lord Chief Justice of Africa or something. And I told him with great excitement about this press conference the next day. And there was dead silence. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, Jane, do you know who the president of the London Zoological Society is? So Solly Zuckerman, who was Winston Churchill's main science advisor, do you think he's going to make any changes because somebody who hasn't even been to college comes and talks to the press? So I said, well, no, if you put it like that, no. I'm very young and naive then. So I said, but what shall I do? I really want to help the chimps. He said, tell me four or five things that would make a difference now. So I told him, I said, shelter from the sun, door open so they can move in and out, providing water during the day, providing some bedding, providing more things for them to do. Within two weeks, all those things were done. 
So the lesson is you don't need to claim credit for making change. It's what you want to do is to make the change, not to get glory from it. And hopefully the person who makes the change will take the credit and that will help them to be better people. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Jane, as we're starting to wrap this amazing session up, I, I, we live in a small town of 10,000 people. And in the States, that's quite small. And it seems like um, that a lot of the attention is in the larger metropolitan areas. And the reason why I host this event is for my students and the community to know that they can still make a big difference even if they're from a small town and we're not on the TV set every night. Um, and so um, could you just speak for a moment um, to those of us in the world who live in small town USA um, who sometimes think uh, the, the world may be forgetting us? Well, I think one thing that would be a very good exercise is to look up all the famous people and see how many came from obscure beginnings. I mean, certainly in Tanzania, some of the people who get to the top, they start off in a mud hut, sharing the, the mud hut at night with chickens and goats. And they somehow rise up. So anybody, I've said it lots of times, everybody makes a difference. I think everybody uh, matters and everybody has a role to play. And sometimes I think it's far, far, far better to be in a small community than to be in one of these big cities where life becomes, it becomes a crazy rush and people are totally disconnected with nature. And, you know, so one of our projects with Roots and Shoots is urban tree planting in, in um, areas. I mean, if you walk, go through a big city, you go through the wealthy parts and there's all these like tree lined avenues. Then you get to a, a place where disadvantaged people live. It's all cement, there's no trees. And that's got to change because we now know that trees can, can um, help to alleviate crime and health as well. They improve health, mental and physical. So it, it doesn't matter where you come from. And personally, I think people in big cities probably make less difference because they're caught up in this rat race. They don't have time to think and to, to interact with nature and to hear the birds singing. And we need that for our good development. So personally, I think you can tell your students how lucky they are that they're not in a big city and that they can make just as much or more difference. And it depends on them freeing up their indomitable spirit to do what they want to do and share hope and wisdom with everybody all over the world now with this social media. Dr. Jane, do you have any final comments for us? No, I've said them all. I mean, I, I think <laughs> the most important thing is to remember that every day we as individuals make a difference. I think that is the most important, important thing. And then, of course, a final word. Please, everybody, join us in Roots and Shoots and become part of our family because it's a wonderful family and it's in 86, seven countries. I mean, 67 countries and it's growing all the time and we need more groups in america we need everybody involved so please join us find out about it at the very least dr jane you have my word we will be starting a roots and shoots chapter and it would be the greatest honor if these fine students of greensburg high school could one day meet you at a roots and shoots oh. convention in the future yeah well let's hope that we soon can travel again. I mean, you know, I've been grounded for a year now. And the reason that I have to get closer, my voice is going. That's why you couldn't suddenly hear me. But I hope you, you didn't miss out on what I was saying, did you? Not a bit. And I didn't want you to miss out on this. We have 3,000 people that are applauding you right now. No, now you say that the hardest thing for me has been to give talks 
instead of in an auditorium where you get the feedback, you say something funny, people laugh. You say something meaningful and people applaud. Uh, you, you tell a sad story and you see tears in the eyes. But this talking at a little <laughs> dot so that people think you're looking at them, trying to put the same energy into the talk, that's been difficult. I mean, I yes, I do it. I know I do it, but it's not easy. It's not easy because you just don't get the feedback. You did it very well. And we thank you so much from little Greensburg, Indiana. Okay, well, remember, you're very lucky to live in a little place. Very thank you. Lucky indeed. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane. Bye. All Bye. the best. Bye, everyone. See you again somewhere sometime, I'm sure. Bye. We can only hope. <laughs>